So um, today I give two lectures on the <coughs> Kodara classification. classification of the compact uh, just to be a very precise connected uh, complex manifolds of dimension two. something that I, that I was sloppy about yesterday and you pointed out. I was somehow regarding these as functions on the manifold, which is of course wrong. They're sections and bundles of the manifold. But I, let me just mention if you have a section in this thing, then you know you can write it as S alpha on the trivialization. And let me just try S alpha beta as beta, and if you have a coordinate on the fiber, defined by a frame, in this case it's just one dimensional, say so call the fiber coordinate Z alpha on the trivialization, then Z alpha is equal to F alpha beta to the minus one. You can just check it, it goes the other way. And that means that if you multiply these two things, the transition gets killed. So you see this is a uh, this is a globally defined holomorphic function on the bundle space. So the fiber coordinate is only defined use the bundle. Of course sections are local functions, but the fiber coordinate is only defined on the bubble. It gives you a coordinate on the fiber. So the alpha is defined on the fiber. So, of course, this is a function downstairs on the base, but this is a function upstairs. So what you get here is a function upstairs. And you see what this is. This is a holomorphic function which is linear on the fibers. Because this thing is linear. So that that's so this this, this is what I was talking about. This is this is really L. <laughs> then if you do the same thing for Ln, so Zn is the fiber, z to the n pi the power n is the fiber coordinate on L to the n. <clears throat> so you do the thing, same thing. If you have a section, you can do the same thing, and then you realize this thing is <clears throat> the space of homomorphic functions on L, which are, maybe if I write here, if you don't mind here, I will write here n, which are uh, homogeneous polynomials in Z of degree N. So linear, quadratic, and so on. And in fact, Broward's point of view on all of this, at least for a lot of, a lot of his work, is he takes a function he, on holomorphic on the bundle space, uses the holomorphic geometry of the bundle space, and then writes this thing as a power series, at least formally, where he, these are sections of uh, L to the N, and this is the fiber coordinate. We joke around in complex geometry, Bias Schoss is the first uh, power series king, and Grauert is the second. Bias Schoss also liked very much to develop things in power series, 
And uh, this is a very, very good method to go up and back and forth between uh, functions on the bundle space and sections or cohomology downstairs. Yeah, so this space here, uh, as, as yesterday Mihai pointed out that I was a little bit very sloppy, this space really uh, is the space of functions upstairs. Okay, so this ring uh, uh, should be realized as um, the space of functions upstairs. So if you like, this is just a space of homomorphic functions upstairs. I'll write, well, when I write square bracket, I mean homomorphic on the bundle space. And then you go to the quotient field. This is what we talked about yesterday, the degraded quotient field in this thing, because it's graded by these, by these uh, fiber coordinate powers. The degraded, degraded quotient field is now a space of functions downstairs, because the, the fiber coordinate goes down and vanishes. So this is Clears up what you were talking about. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. But why is it uh, so? So it's it's a for every n it will be inside C of L or? Yes, it's it's holomorphic. Yeah, I I try to say it here. If you have the fiber coordinate on L to the n right. is Z to the n. So what you're doing here is a section uh, Z S alpha Z alpha to the n, and this thing's a section. Of uh, uh, L to the end. Right. And but uh, but uh, here, the, this thing transforms uh, oh, to the end, and this thing transforms to the minus n, and then they kill each other. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's purely formal, but uh, I think a lot of people prefer thinking upstairs. I know Zeldich does, for example, in his consideration. Um, oh, yeah. It's, it's equivalent. But of course, when you go to the graded quotient, you're, you're, you're quoting out each, each, taking the monomorphic functions at each, uh, each thing. And of course, then the transition function, everything goes down to the, the quarter point. OK, so uh, one checks that this thing is always an algebraic function field. Uh, let me just write it here. It's, Generated by it, so many functions of transcendence degree, maybe even our right here, D for degree for transcendence degree, so D for uh, of this field, and, and extended by some function. So that's the way this thing looks. That's a theorem. <coughs> that's a theorem, and so <coughs> maybe we can sometimes call D equal to the algebraic dimension of X with respect to L. all the stuff you can get out of one bundle, okay? And then uh, the algebraic dimension of x, of course, this is maybe a smaller field, but you can, uh, you can actually, given the whole function field, you can organize a bundle that you get the whole thing. I don't want to talk about that. This is just the full field, the transcendence degree of the full field. yesterday, the possibilities for this thing uh, are only threefold with x to the surface. This is completely general what I just said, but in case for x to the surface. This, that is to say, this transcendence degree is always less than or equal to the dimension. Degrees of accuracy. Okay? So this is a kind of silly number, either 0, 1, or 2. Okay? And we now more or less along these lines go to the co direct image. And the co 
Rivera dimension is more or less, so I'll make it precise, in the other, is, but it's more or less the algebraic dimension of the canonical bubble. Okay, so that's a canonical number. The line bundle has to do with some divisor you choose and so on. This, this is really a canonical number. You have to be a little bit careful. Uh, there, are, there are four cases here, so Kodara dimension minus infinity uh, means no power. This means that there are no sections at all except for the zero section for every power of the canonical number. There's nothing, ever. Okay, just like in P1. Kodara dimension zero means that this thing is one dimensional. You okay equals uh, one for some n, but always less than one. Less than or equal to one. So you can occasionally have a section as you go out, but you get no more. So, you know, if you take the quotient of two, I mean, if you only have one section, there's nothing to do. You take the quotient, all you can get, <laughs> yeah? So you see there's nothing transcendental here over the, over the complex numbers. There's nothing here. There's nothing transcendental over the complex numbers. So this is a, uh, and uh, this, this that, that's, well, in some sense that's exactly, uh, that's degree zero in some sense, right? Nothing transcendental. But we, ins we insist that you, this is not empty. I mean, we insist that we have something. And then uh, Kodara dimension equal one. This means that in fact the, the, the algebraic dimension of, of the canonical bundle is one. So transcendence would be one. And Kodara dimension two means uh, that this thing is two. Okay, so that, those are the four things. And, and here I should note uh, here. Uh, I make a note of there's a theorem of Kodara, I think it's Kodara, show it. In general, if the algebraic dimension of a surface is 2, then, uh, in fact, only then, of course, x is projected algebraic. So we go into the, if we at least have two independent Bernoulli functions, we go into the algebraic geometric setting. This is the structure of the classification. In some sense, you put every surface into one of these classes and describe, describe it. It's a question of what it means description. I think maybe I can give you a little idea of what it means description today. <coughs> Sometimes a very precise description. This is it. Yeah. Um, the key tool, of course, is, um, well, I've gone down on this blackboard, but let me go over here. One, there are many key tools, so let me just say one of the first key tools. Uh, number one is the riemann roch theorem. You notice in one company, very well, riemann roch is very important. Proved er, uh, very early in the game for the algebraic case, but very late in the game, I gave the history yesterday. Riemann, riemann, <laughs> riemann roch. Yeah. Uh, let me tell you what the statement is. Is this um, the Euler characteristic of? Oh, I'm going to write it in the language that we use for Riemann surfaces. Okay, the Euler characteristic for for a given divisor, you have the sheaf of germs of meromorphic functions where poles are allowed along that divisor are worse or less. Yeah, it's the same thing. Okay. Is the Euler characteristic of O of the trivial bundle, and you always have to compute that, plus, uh, and now there's going to be some numbers here that I have to explain. But these are, this is a numerical invariant of the divisor. This is, these are integers, so it's already interesting something's even. Um, this, this, this is, of course, an integer. 
computer. So I should explain these things. And of course, you need to compute the order characteristic of, of O. And that's also part of one of the main parts, if not the main part of this Riemann Rolf theorem. So this thing I told you yesterday, um, and I'm going to explain in better detail today, is this. 1 12th, uh, two invariants, which turn out to be topological invariants. The one invariant is very uh, naive. This is the topological order characters. So you can really compute it uh, straight out in terms of topology. And now I need, need to tell you what these things mean. Right? And then I will tell you what these things mean, and then you understand everything. So, <clears throat> for uh, D1 intersect D2, what that, that should mean, it's called D1, inter the intersection of D1 and D2, you will see in a minute it really is an intersection, uh, you, you know that the second cohomology, if you believe that this is equal to, uh, <clears throat> by some duality, equal to homology, that these things should be classes here because they're two dimensional. These are two dimensional manifolds here, sub manifolds, or here, sub varieties, and with formal coefficients. This is smooth, so these are beta divisors as well. So you can write these things as, as just homology cycles, as I talked about N1, X1, oh, I don't know, I shouldn't write it like this, C1 plus NK, CK, where these are. Come back curves with some multiplicity, so you, and you realize them here. So, uh, what you would like to do, uh, if you're optimistic, is is define <laughs> define uh, d1 times d2 as uh, d1 intersecting. Right. So, what does that mean? If, if you're optimistic. Uh, here's, D, here's D1, pieces, several pieces, D1, say it's like that, and then D2 is something else complicated maybe, and, uh, and D2 intersects here beautifully and so on, but maybe it goes through here, this is a terrible thing, you don't know how to compute that intersection number, that's terrible. Here this is transversal, and you see any, it, because everything is complex analytic, this, this, oriented, this is really oriented here. So this gives you a number plus one, this will give you a number plus one, this will give you a number plus one, this will give you a number plus one, you, right? you just count. But the trouble is you don't know what you're doing here. So what you need is a, is a generic intersection. Right? You need to be able to move D1 and D2 homotopically somehow. So the, the hope is move move D1 and D2 to general position. Okay, so this is the hope that you can do this and uh, uh, you have to understand what that means. So here, by the way, uh, if you're ever interested in reading this, I recommend that you read Beauville's um, Beauville wrote a, a, a big, big chapter in uh, Asterix. Aster, I don't know what it is. How do you spell Asterix? Probably. It's Asterix by on surfaces. He really carefully discusses this question of the intersection pairing, realizing the intersection pairing uh, in complex geometry. Let me tell you what you, what you do. Okay. So the first thing is, is that the intersection pairing D1 intersect D2 should be only be dependent on the divisor class of these things. What does that mean? That means if D1 is equivalent to D2 in the sense that, i.e., D1 
D1 and D2, the line bundles of D1, these two line bundles, I'm sorry, let's say D1, D1 tilde, the line bundle, D1 and D1 tilde are the same or isomorphic, of course. Okay? That means, what does that mean? That means in the same line bundle, the meaning of this thing, in the same line bundle, you have a section S which defines D, which defines D1. And I'm sorry, I don't know why I said D1. Well, that will be this D1. And you have S tilde, which defines D1 tilde. Two sections in the same line bundle. So uh, as usual, S over S tilde is the globally defined meromorphic function. That means this meromorphic function is a mapping of the surface at onto P1. This meromorphic function where it is zero, here is S equal to zero or something. I don't know. I draw it like it's not C. So maybe this is S equal to zero. That lies over the point one zero. And here's S tilde equal to zero. That lies over the other point that's the point infinity, zero one. And you think of a, a linear family as I always said, of moving from there to there. So it is very reasonable to say that this intersection pairing only depends on the line bundle. If these two things are equivalent in this sense, that means they're in a linear family uh, geometrically, and the intersection number should not depend on them. Okay, that's, that's the first point in the theory. You assume that you, if you're going to build an intersection number theory, you, you're going to have this. Okay, and now watch. It has to be bilinear. So what you do is, you do the following. You write D1 plus HD2. Uh, HH, I'm going to tell you what H is in a minute. Whatever it is, this has to be bilinear. D1, D2 plus H, D2. Uh, right? Okay. If, <clears throat> if I can, if this is true, and this must be true, it has to be a bilinear theory. Yeah? then I'm allowed to do this. Now here's the idea of algebraic geometry. If you, if you take a divisor, okay, and you take, this is D1, and you take another divisor, which is very, very positive. Remember, we had these things with NP and N plus 1P and all these things. You get a lot of sections. So if you add on some very positive thing here, like this, then this thing, becomes what the algebraic geometers call ample. This means, uh, this means that you have many, many sections of this bundle. So this means this thing can be moved. This means this means this thing can be moved. So for we always say for the degree for for H sufficiently positive, it follows that that this divisor is is can be can be moved to general position. General position. At the same time, you can do anything with this thing, a positive divisor. I'm moving it with an automorphism in the projective space. General position. Uh, and and, and uh, H with the general position with respect. to D2, okay, and also H general possession with respect to D2. Now I'm giving an argument right here uh, a la Italian mathematics of the 19th century, 19th century and 20th century. They, they knew you could do this if you, if you embed X in projector space, take hyperplanes, I mean, you can move them by automorphisms. And so you can really move things to general position here um, uh, and, and get such things. So you see, if you have V1, which is like this, and maybe with a, a terrible singularity here, and D2, D2 goes through it and you hate it. This is D2. Then you can't compute. So what you do is you take, and I'm going to draw this in, in 
in uh, red, you take H. Something H is positive. This is, this is going to look like this. Now H plus D1 is still a horrible divisor. So what you do is now, you take H plus D1, or D1 plus H, and you move it. And you can really move it, let us say, with some parameter. Uh, let's say you move it in, a, in, this, in this series here, D1 plus H with uh, a parameter T someplace here in general position. And what's it going to be? It's not going to be D1 plus H anymore, but it's going to be much, much better. It's going to be smooth. So let's, let's, call this, let's call this green. <laughs> this will be green. So it's going to be smooth. This is D1 plus H. Uh, I'm not going to be very good at doing this, but the point is it's going to go be smooth. And it's going to, oh, it's a uh, same color. It's terrible. Blue. It's going to be smooth. If you choose it right, and it's going to hit, it's going to hit D1 well, it's going to hit D2 well. That means well means transversal at every point where it hits it. You understand what I'm saying? It'll be perfect at every point where it hits it. Okay, so you can count. One, two, three, four, five, six. You add it up. Okay, that means I move it. It doesn't change anything. I compute. I get a number. And I move this, it doesn't change anything, I get a number. And now, now I know what this number is. It's this number minus this number. Even though this intersection is horrid. Again, I move this to general position with respect to that. It hits where I can just count. Also at the same time with respect to that, I count. And the, this is defined as that minus that. Yeah. yeah. With, as it looks, you may move it in many different Absolutely. And you have to prove it's great. Big theory. Right? This is, so the Italians, this is typical Italians at that time, they, they knew somehow it doesn't matter, but maybe they didn't prove anything. And that was probably first proved rather recently, say, maybe, but, but Kodara certainly knew, knew he proved it. So that's why I'm suggesting the proof of this, for example, you can find beautifully written in both his uh, notes. The French really took very good care to prove a lot of these things carefully, and that's one of them. Okay. Now, there's no one before that, but even, even in the early 50s, this kind of stuff was still a little bit hocus pocus. <laughs> yeah. But not so long ago. So that's what it means, the intersection number. Okay. Yeah. And you see, as a result of all this stuff, is that minus that is very it's very possible for the intersection number to be negative. <laughs> and I should mention then a beautiful theorem of Grauert, which is extremely useful um, um, in general. Suppose you have this is defined for curves with multiplicity or cycles. Suppose you have two cycles, C1 and C2. And now, if you have these two cycles, each cycle ha has uh, components. You see them, so all these components are by by with multiplicities, right? And you have the intersection matrix of these two cycles. I think it's completely clear what that means, right? Right? This is. Uh, this cycle is C1 is uh, I N1 C N J C J and C2 I don't know. Let, let's do it with that. Let's do it with C and C tilde so we don't. Okay, and then we have C and C, C and, and NJ CJ and, and C tilde is uh, N tilde. Uh, J, C, J, J tilde, right? And then you have a quadratic form defined over the integers. And the statement is uh, that C can be blown down, uh, can be blown down to a point, of course, highly singular in general, if and only if. Intersection matrix of the self-intersection 
with negative value. That's an incredibly beautiful theory. You have a very complicated thing with self-intersection numbers and intersection numbers with each other. That's some huge matrix of integers. And you can blow it down to a point, uh, which is this. Okay. This kind of thing is extremely important in the theory of classification. This, and to give you the time frame on this, is, this is one of the extremely beautiful paper of Grauer in the uh, 19, more or less 1960 plus minus. So, by the way, could I read that also? So. Okay, that says something about the intersection theory. And then that says that the riemann roth theory, the riemann roth statement at least, <laughs> that's the self-intersection, that's the intersection of the canonical divisor, one half, that's that, that's that, that's that, that's that, that's that. <laughs> okay, I've told you everything they did except that. <laughs> okay, let me tell you that. So one thing to tell you that, you're not going to be happy about this, but it's this. Just the self-intersection number of the canonical divide. This is a mysterious thing. It means if you have... If you have, if you can at least move the canonical divisor, maybe you can understand it. I mean, you have one, one uh, uh, divisor from it, and then you can move it, and you're lucky it intersects, then, then this will be the counting of the intersection numbers. But it, this is sort of a mysterious thing uh, that uh, uh, I would like to present in a more general context. And now I would like to enter the realm of complex differential geometry. You see, all these things are connected. Um, uh, you know, I think it was really a fundamental discovery of churn. These are called churn numbers. Uh, I would like to present churn numbers in general. Churn to uh, churn churn's notion uh, formalism of a connection. So this is very old business, certainly going back to Lady Civita, the great Italian differential geometers at the beginning of the 20th century. But Schoen <coughs> certainly knew this, this, I don't know when he knew how to do all this, but certainly right after the Second World War he was understanding. Andre V <coughs> certainly also understood this very well too. So let's just uh, suppose we have a differentiable vector bundle. Uh, just a differentiable, not holomorphic or anything. And the naive thing, if you're naive in calculus one, this boy from Nepal who came yesterday in calculus one, he'll, tie, he'll say, well, if I have a section here, uh, I like to differentiate. So the idea is that you want to differentiate sections. also important for quantum mechanics because you you really want to uh, your your objects in quantum mechanics are never really not functions they will always be sections of some sort you want to apply differential operators somehow to these, to these uh, sections so you have to say what does it mean differentiated section so a section is uh, uh, something in uh, the vector bundle and you learn, if you learn a little bit about calculus, that you should never think about differentiating something. You should, you should think about taking the differential of something. 
So the derivative is something you get by evaluating the differential, right? Directional derivative of a function is computed by taking the differential and evaluating that direction. So it is a mapping from, uh, it is a stupid mapping. Now here, uh, uh, I'm just, here I'm just going to write uh, t star n uh, x, and here, this is the cotangent bundle, I mean here the real cotangent bundle, everything, I mean, so, the, what I mean is the real cotangent bundle, but thought of as a complex vector bundle, uh, a cotangent bundle. tensor with C so that we can talk about this over the complex term. So that means just simply <coughs> this simply means that sections of these things uh, are of the form, sections are of the form of E tensor this thing are of the form uh, local uh, stuff S equals uh, so for surfaces I'll write one down uh, A1 BZ1 A2 BZ2 uh, A3 BZ3 bar 2 BZ1 bar maybe, maybe, maybe put B here B1 BZ1 bar B2 so locally, just like that. No, no big deal. But however, of course, we tested with this with this bundle, so it means the AIs the AI and the BIs uh, are, are in sections of the bundle are in the B. So they transform as well. Okay, it's obvious. The differential takes a section and you get a one form. it. Now, if you, and, and of course I have to tell you what it means, differential of f times the section, it has to, it has to be real linear too, right? It certainly has to be linear. So it's, uh, B is, is, okay, complex linear, of course, it's a derivation. And it's what, you, what it is in uh, my course in the previous semester, B of fs is f ds plus f, okay, s, d, f. So a line is really satisfied. You can't imagine the old literature of Lady Chivita explaining what a connection is and how this thing simplifies. That's a connection. All co this means connection. Okay. Right? And if you want to differentiate a partial derivative, a partial, partial derivative of a section, you write it like this, you've seen it in these courses. And that means just like you do in calculus, you differentiate, take the differential of these things, that's a one form, and you evaluate it at x. So that's how you differentiate a section with respect to a vector. Okay. Well, as I hope I tried to motivate, once you have in calculus, once you have a differential operator of this type, you can extend it by requiring everything you want, except you cannot require that it's d squared is zero. Way, if you think about it carefully, just the <coughs> Leibniz rule should uh, be continued on. Uh, I mean, we talked about this in one variable. I mean, the d of f times something should, should be this way as that. So this thing is automatically defined for, forever. And the problem is, as you've seen a hundred times, I try to say, in general, this thing is not zero.
This is operator is not zero, and therefore we give it a name. Some, some people call it F, and this is called uh, curvature. Now you can imagine what this thing is. <clears throat> this is a vector bundle mapping. You prove that it's a vector bundle mapping. So we have F. It's a vector bundle mapping. It turns out not just at the level of sections. The, the, the initial differential operator is only at the level of sections. But this really is a vector bundle mapping from E to differential form, two forms with values in E. while well, it's a vector bundle map. So in local coordinates, it's a matrix. Right? It is a matrix. So, so F, F alpha is in local coordinates, omega alpha, where omega alpha uh, are, are, are two forms. Of course, they have to transform some way with, with, values, which, with, with values in E. It's just a uh, homomorphism from one bundle to another, uh, but here you can write it down as two form, differential two form. Okay. Now suppose, suppose the gij, gij are the transition matrices. Uh, for the bundle E. Okay. That's interesting to see what the transition matrices are for this induced thing, D squared. Well, the transition uh, matrices for D squared are this. If you write this thing down as omega I or omega J, whatever it is. That, so omega, uh, just uh, maybe I'll get it right here. With, without our guarantee of, uh, oh, I'm sorry, F, this is the matrix, F, FI, the curvature matrix, FI is GIJ, curvature matrix, FJ, GIJ, inverse. It's not very surprising because it's a homomorphism. Right? So here's how this thing transforms. Okay? I think it's worthwhile, and then you don't learn much from me, but it's worthwhile learning this. You want to know what curvature is in the modern sense. Curvature in the modern sense is a second order differential operator like this. Okay? The first order differential operator just differentiates functions or sections or whatever. But this is it. So, given a connection on the bundle E, you have the curvature of that connection, and this is it. Basta. This is it. Okay? But it's natural that they come in. Hmm? It's natural. I mean, one It's not natural? No, I see. It's completely natural. natural. I mean, one variable that just gives you convection. Yeah, but yeah, in some sense, that's right. That's a very nice remark. Yeah. In one variable, it just gives you, yeah. It just gives you curvature. Yeah, and of course, it'll be mixed, and there are all sorts of terribly complicated things here. And after all. In second, in second, in, in two variables, it gives you the. The Hessian, which is again curvature. Right. So that's right. It has curvature has to be a second order thing, and this is the curvature associated to differentiation. And you want to, you want to know how the tangent space moves, so that you know curvature. You have great intuition already, and and in fact, I think Levi Chita and, and Bianchi in the earlier times, many people had great intuition along these Blaschke, for example, here in Hamburg had great not understanding of this in differential geometry, but it took Chern, I think it was Chern, to really write down this definition. <laughs> it's so simple. It just focuses our attention on the, on, it's, it's just so beautiful, I love it. Now let me, I haven't said anything about complex geometry, now I will. So now, uh, this is just a C infinity. Oh, I'm sorry. This is C infinity, and the, the point is this. My friend, the point is what my friend Matsushima told me when I was a, a baby in mathematics. In Japanese, he said, mm, many connections. 
problem. Good connection. <laughs> yeah, that's really true. Many connections, yeah. The space of connections, we learn from Atiyah and Donaldson and many other people to look at the whole space of connections and look at natural functionals on the space of connections and then to minimize these functionals in, in some sense of extra energy, find a good connection in the sense of Matsushima. Good connection. Good. Well, there is one, it's not, it's not uh, good, perfectly good, but at least it, it's uh, It's a, some sort of reasonable thing. The homophic vector bundle. So let me just say this. I want to jump over a big hurdle here, but I could fill it in in a day very easily. Okay. So now that act E be uh, a homophic vector bundle. Let's turn and uh, turn, and I've already thought about this. Now, let's assume that H is a bundle metric on E. So this tells us, this means on H, X, and each X is a pairing uh, on the fiber over X, and it is a Hermitian positive definite uh, metric. That's, that's what I mean when I say a bundle metric on a vector bundle. Okay, that's a bundle metric. Okay. And associated to this thing it is in a canonical way. Say so associated to a Hermitian bundle metric is a connection of a certain type. The associated connection to the, uh, so it's a certain associated connection to this thing. In a canonical way. So in some sense, there's a very close connection, as you believe, somehow, between distance and, and, and differentiation. I mean, right? and, and so there is a way to go back and forth, but for example, for uh, in Hermitian bundles, well, it doesn't have to be holomorphic, just Hermitian and to a connection, okay? The key thing is, this thing, so I won't write H anymore, is a, met is a, uh, a matrix of 1-1 one, one forms. It's not just two forms, okay? Remember 1-1 one, one forms, that means here you, these are two forms, so uh, you will have uh, Z alpha wedge, Z alpha bar everywhere, or beta bar, I'm sorry. Right, and some coefficients which are in the bundle. So, so that's, that's, that's a really nice thing. These are good things. Okay. I mean, it's incredible. We, sit this, we, we write this down, and this is a matrix of 1 1 form. And this matrix of 1 1 forms transforms. Uh, in a stupid way. Okay. Right. And then, uh, modern mathematicians forgot about this, well, not, not really, but uh, modern students of mathematics said, don't have forgotten the fact, uh, forgotten to ask the questions, what are the invariants of conjugation? Polynomials, absolutely. Or the basic uh, elementary symmetric polynomials, depending what you what you like. So for example, for example, if uh, E is rank two, you know it with, I mean this is what you learn in high school. There are precisely two invariants, you know them very well, trace and determinant. Okay? Trace. Uh, is an invariant, and determinant is an invariant. 
These things are globally defined function, uh, globally defined form, differential forms, right? What does that mean? This is a trace of a two by two matrix of one forms. So this thing is a one one form, and this is the determinant of uh, a matrix. So this thing is a, is a two two form. So these are globally defined differential forms. Okay, and otherwise. Of course, you have the other, other outer products of these things. So you see that starting with, let, let us review. This is incredibly beautiful and incredibly simple. You have a notion of differentiation. On a complex manifold, the curvature associated with that is a matrix of one one form. You have the basic invariants, which are the, the uh, in this case, the, the uh, the elementary set, symmetric problem. You can take what you want, but we usually we take the symmetric problem. So it's, it's, it's a wedge product. Right. So, and you get C1, C2, C3, C4, C5, Cn. Uh, what are the hmm? uh, What are the odds? The trend is broken. No, the, 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 the of uh, Fin. Hmm? What, what are they? How are they defined? Oh. Let's say C alpha as a differential form with respect to the Hermitian metric is, uh, uh, let's say, Cm uh, is, uh, what am I saying? Well, it's, it's, what is it? It's, I guess, the trace. Okay, This depends on a huge number of things. Right. So the first remark uh, which is made, well proved by churn, I guess, is that these forms, Cm, depending on the matrix, is a closed MM form. So that makes you happy. The Durand class, I, I will even emphasize, is the notion of the Durand class of type MM, so differential forms of type MM of X, is independent. This is the exciting thing of H. Or the connection, but I, I, I like to take a Hermitian metric. This is an invariant of the bundle. Okay, so given a, a for example, holomorphic vector bundle, you go through all the stuff with the connection, blah blah blah, curvature matrix, blah blah blah, invariants of the curvature matrix, blah blah blah. Look at the cohomology classes. A priori, that depends on everything. In the end, it depends only on the bundle. So these are cohomology classes uh, for a given vector bundle. And then you want numbers associated to this vector bundle, not just cohomology classes. You want back something simpler, numbers. And so you look at what we call churn polynomials. Dimension two, there aren't very many, but in higher dimensions there are many. So a churn polynomial, a churn polynomial. Monomial problem, call it 
should say, really monumental. Uh, so it equals C1 to the K1, that means wedge product. It doesn't matter because it's a KK form, it's an M11 form. Uh, and you don't even write wedge product anymore because it's just multiplying here. Even, even things, they all commute, so it's really a polynomial actually. Uh, C M K M where the sum of the ki's, kj, for example, equals the dimension of the space. Okay, you wedge all these things together, get a monomial. Okay, so by the way, since, again, let me say, since the, this is a one-on-one form, there's a two-two form, three-three form, and so on. So you see, when you interchange, you, don't, you interchange two things always. So it's really a yeah, polynomial algebra. Well, this turn things to find some, something like that. And of course, then you get a number, the integral of these things over x. I'll just write it down and remind you what this is, which is a churn number associated to this polynomial. So you get a huge number of numbers here. Now, I mean, of course, there's some repetition, but note in dimension two, if dimension x is equal to, there are really only two numbers. <laughs> These numbers, c1 squared, this is the inter this is a number, you, you mix the notation, it's the integral of c1 wedge c1. Alright, and c2 squared, the c2 is the integral just of the term class, term form c2. <clears throat> These are the, this is just bad notation. These are differential forms, these are the numbers. Okay? So you wedge up to dimension. This is really beautiful. And so it's sum of j k j. There is sum of j k j is dimension of x. J k j. What I mean if dimension of x equals two, you have three possibilities for the case. Yeah, 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 yeah. So but in order to obtain what you said, I think it's J K J, because you also multiply the order. Oh, 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 yeah, 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 of course. So, yeah, 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 yeah you're absolutely right, because this is a one form, this is a two form, that's what you said. Mm -hmm. And that is J K J. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Wedge up so everything has the right dimension, and then you integrate. And you get a number. Okay, so this is a number. Very beautiful. And you see, in dimension two is not so bad. And in, in, in dimension two, even in dimension two, it looks like maybe, well, somebody tells you this is the Euler character, topological Euler characteristic. But then nobody tells you what this thing is, and this all looks very holomorphic because it has to do with the holomorphic tangent bundle, right? I mean, it looks very holomorphic. But the, it, you can read from the theory that this is actually a topological invariant. And that is really beautiful because you see the Euler characteristic of OD uh, equals, what was it? The Euler characteristic of, oh, I'm going to write everything down here, 1 12 C1 squared plus C2, this is topological, plus 1 half D intersect D, this purely numerical invariance of D minus D intersect K. So as Matsushima said, mathematics, mathematics, left hand side, right hand side, interesting mathematics. Left hand side, completely different quality from right hand side. <laughs> right? I mean, it's really, it's really beauty, right? This is purely, this is the American stuff. Topological, yeah, very fantastic theorem. This is Riemann Roll theorem, this is used throughout this theorem. Okay? So that was the one general method. I, want, I hope I can explain to you. So, why is 1 over 12? Yeah, that's a very interesting thing. I mean, I, I, I'm not. I don't work in this area that much, but I've thought about it. It's very interesting. Yeah. A lot of people really get interested in these numbers, and not just guys joking around. His book is very interested in these numbers. And um, also because uh, uh, of physical reasons. Okay? Because physicists are looking uh, for manifolds. You see, these are four dimensional manifolds. 
yes? Space-time manifolds. And if you're doing some kind of physics, you're looking at vector bundles over four-dimensional manifolds over space-time. And then you get numbers. You get churn numbers, you get Euler numbers, you get all sorts of numbers. And the physicists want some numbers. They know somehow what numbers should be appearing here. Right? And so mathematicians start looking for these numbers, manifolds with these numbers. And so something like, why the devil does 1 12th appear? <laughs> becomes an interesting question. And there's an engine here. That's, yeah, that to me, when I first saw that, it was, I couldn't believe it. Though. Why? Of course, already in Riemann services, the Euler characteristic is divisible by 2, which is somehow something. So, uh, and here's one was very, very good with numbers, and he knew all the numbers on all these manifolds and thought about them a lot. Uh, okay, so that was that. So I have, according to Latif, I have 10 minutes, right? So I will go, I just want to give you this one uh, very nice uh, introduction. I like Chern very much. One of the kindest people you will ever meet who helped so many people and had many wonderful students. <clears throat> Did a lot for American mathematics, but also supported, particularly after, of course, after uh, recent years, supported the uh, Chinese mathematics. Great. But he's a German, no? Huh? Or a Polish? Yeah. German? Mm -hmm. Chinese. Sure. Sure. <clears throat> but he studied he, uh, with Blaschke here in Hamburg, then went back to China. People worried about him. What's a typical Chinese name? Huh? Churn guys. Churn, yeah, Chinese. Then came back to the United States to the University of Chicago. At the time, they had really interesting, Andre Lay was professor there, many interesting professors at the University of Chicago. And then moved to Berkeley in the 60s. And So, um, I want to talk now about Kodara dimension zero. So, okay, I've explained the main, one main piece of the technology, Riemann Roth theorem. Uh, now I'd like to go to what, what will you find in Kodara dimension zero in seven minutes. <laughs> it's, this is a huge, beautiful class because, for one thing, it contains Torah. And they, these Torah, of course, appear in many even applied areas. So let me say this is a, a C2 to the power 2 modulo a lattice of rank 4, spanned by, by four uh, vectors. And we usually take a basis, and when we take a basis, we can adjust these bases by making linear transformations to put them, the first two elements to be 1, 0, 0, 1, and then some very complicated possibly other elements here generating the lattice. Um, uh, and the numerics, I mean, how these things fit together really tell you a lot about uh, the function theory of the torus. And the one remark just you should make is that, I, I mean, there are many remarks you should make, is that uh, for this lattice generic, let's call this x, uh, some, some generic, I mean, you, you pick a random lattice, and there are no meromorphic functions on this thing other than the constants. In fact, there are no curves, there's no nothing. Well, the vector model. Okay. So if you're interested in this subject as I am, I highly recommend you read the book so Moffat. Including his simple little, little book on the so called analytic theory. I want to 
must make every student mind read this. <laughs> What's the name of the book? Tata Lecture Notes on the Bilian Variety, something like this. five minutes now, I can at least tell you the main class, and I'll start the, the, the class of great interest, or the subclass of great interest. Here, in this case, so-called K3 series. say what classification means, these can be realized, and I'll start here this afternoon, with, but I have to put in here a little caveat, with a bit of uh, doubling up, so a real uh, a multiplicity. I will say what that means later this afternoon. So, so these are realized, but in a twenty-dimensional family. That means that there's some twenty-dimensional space which I understand very well, some 20-dimensional space, some, 20, some domain, actually in a quadrate, some 20-dimensional space, actually, uh, yeah. and you should think, you should think, to every point in the space, you have a K3 surface. It's true in some uh, metaphorical sense, but you also have with additional information. So you cannot parameterize these things in a, in a good way just by themselves. You have to add additional information. So we understand this space rather well. We understand this family rather well. 
we understand these K3 surfaces rather well, but there are many, many other interesting things that we need to understand about K3 surfaces. At least, this, I think, is the most important class inside this class. For me, because of various applications, uh, really fantastic class of surfaces, so-called K3 surfaces. Okay. I'll start there this afternoon explaining more about K3 surfaces. They appear all over the place for some unknown reason. Okay. 